Next, we meet up with a scientist to find out about a new treatment for addiction and post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm Barry Everett. I'm a professor of behavioural neuroscience in the Department of Experimental Psychology at the University of Cambridge. Hello, Barry. So we've just been talking to somebody who experienced quite severe addiction for a number of years, and he spoke about overcoming his addiction and rewriting the script, as it were, so removing associations that he had, whether it be particular environments, particular social situations, with his addiction to alcohol. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the research that's going on in this area of rewriting the script in your brain. Yes, and that's an interesting thing that this person has done. So when people begin taking drugs and then make a transition to becoming addicted to them, what happens is generally they take their drugs in a very ritualistic way, in in a very restricted range of environments and in the presence of rather few specific stimuli that are related to their drug taking. Obviously for drinking alcohol it's often in bars and with certain people and it's true for people taking cocaine as well. They have certain kinds of equipment that they use in certain places, sometimes with certain people and quite naturally those stimuli become associated with the effects of taking the drug or drinking alcohol through a learning process that we've known about for well over a 100 years called Pavlovian conditioning and everybody remembers about Pavlov and his dogs and bells and salivation. So a restricted range of otherwise innocuous stimuli in the environment become alcohol cues or cocaine cues or heroin cues. Now it turns out what we've come to understand from our work and others in a clinical situation is those stimuli become very very significant in the course of addiction because they can evoke craving. So somebody may have um, gotten over the physiological addiction to the particular drug and then after that there's a second wave where they have to get over this association with the habit. Yeah, in fact you don't ever really unlearn those associations except recent research has suggested that it might be possible to unlearn their meaning. Now this has kind of been known for many years in some treatment centres for addiction where clinicians have used something called Q exposure therapy. So here what happens is that people seeking to become abstinent, for example to stop drinking, go into the clinic through questioning and discussion, their particular cues are identified and those are presented repeatedly but without alcohol. And this is what the person you were describing earlier has been doing by visiting places where he used used to drink but hasn't drunk. And so you keep repeating over and over again presentation of these cues and it turns out that they elicit less and less and less craving whether you measure that in terms of how people feel or you measure some objective physiological measure like their heart rate or their uh, skin conduction, a measure of sort of sweating on the palms. And this process in psychology is called extinction. Now that's all well and good, but it turns out that extinction is very context or situation dependent. So if you bring someone into the clinic, extinguish those cues so that they're not responding to them. When they go back out into the real world and encounter those same cues, but in the context in which they're normally present, you find they haven't been extinguished at all. So it's not a very successful treatment. So it's a bit like taking someone into the clinic and presenting them maybe with some beer bottles or particular advertising associated with alcohol, um, which is a very different situation to meeting up with your friends on a Friday night in a restaurant where there's wine or there's beer available. Exactly so. So how do you get over that? A couple of things have happened recently which have suggested that the memories elicited by drug-associated stimuli, drug cues, can indeed be erased. And this, this was a big surprise when it was appreciated in, in about 2000. When you retrieve a memory, in the point where the memory is active again, and in the case of drugs, when the cue has elicited your memories of drinking and caused you to crave, that memory becomes labile in a new, active and transient state in the brain, neurochemically. It has to be re-stabilized in the brain, it turns out through another round of, of protein synthesis in cells in the brain. And that's kind of, but not exactly the same, as the process that would have occurred when those memories are being formed in the first place. So we talk about consolidating new learning to form memories. And this process where the memory becomes plastic and must be restabilized again at retrieval is called reconsolidation. And so that reconsolidation of the memory, that point when the memory is quite labile and quite plastic, may be a point where therapeutically you could intervene and start some kind of treatment to dissociate that habit, that association with the drug. Exactly right. Now, it turns out that a very common drug used to treat hypertension, propranolol, which is a beta receptor blocker, 
can block that reconsolidation, that restabilization process. So if you retrieve a memory in the presence of a beta receptor blocker and then come back and look a day or a week or a month later, you find that memory has been erased. Now that's been translated to a clinical setting in the case of post-traumatic stress disorder. People who are greatly affected by um, horrific and intrusive memories of terrible events like war or accidents or rape. And it turns out if you retrieve the memory under beta receptor blockade, not just once, but two or three times, there's an enormous reduction in the intrusiveness of the memory and people are much less bothered by it. Now that particular approach to treatment hasn't yet been applied to drug addiction, but it's something we're planning to do here in an alcohol study. And how do you make sure that you're not going to be erasing any other memories at the same time whilst administering this beta blocker? Because that must be a, a bit of a concern that you would erase a person's memory like the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. That's one of those fears that people always bring up, but actually the conditions under which you can make the memory labile and can influence it are incredibly precisely defined. So you would only ever be able to modulate a memory by focusing on the conditions specific to that memory and reactivating it. And which areas of the brain are these memories, these associations, being affected by the beta blockers? The amygdala, which is well known to be uh, associated with emotional learning and memory, is certainly the case for drug cue and fear cue memories, but also the hippocampus, which is much more to do with spaces and places and, and contextual memories. That was Professor Barry Everett from Cambridge University.